All right, KISS Army, welcome to the KISS FAQ Podcast. Thank you for giving us your time today and letting us into your head. I hope we don't do any damage. This is a KISS-related podcast by the board for the board. We hope that you enjoy. We'd love you to support this show. Please like, follow, and subscribe to us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Your likes and subscription helps us to grow and attract interviews and content. So please retweet and share our posts. Your contributions are appreciated. So you're keen on music? Yes! Welcome to episode 488 of the KISS FAQ podcast. This is not live. I'm not here. I'm actually on holiday, so we're getting ahead and doing an episode for next week, which you're watching now. So this was recorded last week, but we managed to have everyone get together for a very important episode. Uh, Daniel has stayed up late. Welcome back, Wheeze. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the voice of reason is always awake, though he's looking a bit warm. Not always. It's warm on your side of the bridge today. Pretty warm. Yeah, mm -hmm. 59 here. Nice. Uh, Marcus Almighty, Mark. Greetings. And, of course, the voice of unreason. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that Mark with this spot? I, that's I, actually, I actually, yeah, I, I was just saying that. <laughs> oh, like, yeah. Holy shit, that's, that's more Mark, not you. So, Mommy, St. Louis, kiss. All right, today's episode is going to be about the 25th anniversary of Psycho Circus. I don't think we've done a ranking of these songs, so we've got a two-part show here. First of all, we'll be... Uh, the KISS FAQ ranking of the 11 songs that feature on Psycho Circus. So we've included the Japanese bonus track. Um, and then we're going to re-image Psycho Circus as the album that we thought or think that it should have or could have been with some of those additional... Uh, oh. <laughs> oh my God. Well, that's Mark's comments on the album summed up in there's, a single there's a syllable. Mute button. There's a mute Mark button. Mark thinks about Psycho Circus. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, part two will be uh, just everyone running through their re-imaging of the album and how they would have released it had they been in control at that time. But first of all, there is KISS news this week. KISS is about to be live on Australian TV about the AFL show that they're going to be doing, so no real news there. But also they've announced a opening act that is not uh, a Nepo baby for Canada. Canada is going to get Crown Lands. Mark, as our resident Canadian, um, tell us about Crown Lands, and then I want you to tell us one song that should introduce that band to someone who's never had heard of them and has no fucking clue who Crown Lands is. Okay, Crown Lands is a two-piece band. Okay, I know right away when you hear that, you're like, yeah. two-piece? What the hell is going on? Like, so it's a drummer who sings, so it already tipping the hat to another great Canadian band, Triumph, who had a singing drummer as well. And the other guy plays guitar, bass, keyboards, Taurus bass pedals. He does everything. Um, they are a prog, uh, hard rock slash blues based band. Now, they, all of those things are present in their music. Um, they, It's like Genesis meets Rush meets the, a bit of Led Zeppelin uh, and stuff like that. And it, it's very uh, it, it's very musically diverse. Um, if you're if you're if you're looking for a show that you're gonna see if you're looking for a guy to run around back and forth on the stage and doing all kinds of crazy things, this is not the band for you. Okay. Because these guys are pretty much <clears throat> stationary and have to be because the guy is like playing three things at once, the drummer singing and playing drums. And like, so they're, but the music is unbelievable. When I first heard Crownlands, I, 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 my jaw dropped. And that takes a lot now for me to have my jaw drop for anything. Okay. Because I, because most stuff that comes out now sucks. Let's face it. Okay. So, and this stuff was a really fantastic. It was like such a throwback to like the seventies, early eighties prog stuff that I was like, I was loving it. I mean, the big drum set is back, you know, all the kind of moog keyboards and, uh, you know, the double neck guitars and stuff like that. Fantastic. And the guy, you know, he has a pretty high range singing voice as well. Right. And to top it all off, they even got the guy, one of the last uh, record producer guys that worked with Rush to do their <laughs> most recent record. So 
And Alex Lifeson did guest on an upcoming recording that's going to be probably on our next record. So um, fantastic stuff. And if you want, if, if you want me to recommend something, I would recommend starting with one of their EPs. To be quite honest with you, which is called White Buffalo. This is really, really good. What a standout album. When I first heard that, it was stuck in my car for like at least three weeks. It had never left my car. I mean, from the instrumental of Inner Light at the beginning to the title track to the longer song like The Oracle, which is like 13 minutes long. There's not one bad moment on here. And one last thing. On YouTube, if you put in Crownlands Live, there's like a performance that they did to an empty club when it was during COVID. They performed like music from both of their albums, I think they had at that time. Uh, just on stage, bunch of lighting on them and stuff. And it's incredible. Put on a good pair of headphones, give yourself about an hour and listen to this stuff. You won't be sorry. It was, it's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. I got to kind of echo and disagree with a lot of what he said because... <laughs> I, I had no idea who this band was. I immediately went to Spotify, found an album, just press play on one track. And I happened to just grab their latest album, Fearless, mm -hmm. and hit Starlifter, which is the first Fearless Part 2, um, as my first experience of Crownlands. And my jaw literally dropped. So I agree with you on that. But I got a whole bunch of Rush Mm -hmm. like caress of steel vibes coming from a lot of that material but yeah. then you break into sections and you're getting subdivisions you're getting all you can see a lot of their influences obviously canadian prog which by definition is rush yeah. um but it's also that it's not that rush that everyone thinks of 2112 and beyond it's the early rush which has uh you know a lot of the zeppelin-esque you know features mm -hmm. so they're like greta van fleet but they don't suck yeah, you know they've got more than one good song. I Greta, I you know, found maybe three songs were tolerable, and they got really withering with those vocals because that was the only vocals that he seemed to be able to. I think it's what's his name, Josh, um, seemed to do. But this stuff, White Buffalo, I'm glad you mentioned because if I was going to give a, someone a pick for one song to go and check, White Buffalo is a good one. Citadel's another very good one. Yeah, and that's off the new one. So I'm actually surprised that Kiss have picked a really fucking hot. Um, sounding group because yeah. it's like 1975 again for yeah. people who saw kiss and rush together when rush was supporting fly by night and uh, you know mm. then then they did caress of steel and um you know am i going bald um and all that stuff <laughs> um you know i think it's a really freaking cool combination so um yeah as you can tell i'm i'm kind of you know excited about that as a combination so uh very cool check them uh, out and i'll say this if i if i was on the fence before about going to see kiss in november this has kind of now made me want to go definitely more kind now to, to go to go see it because and you know and i and i can't and i can't believe i said this on on one of the one of the live streams before but you know depending on how good it is you know i i'm hoping that kiss brings it because i'm gonna i know i'm not gonna be disappointed with Crownlands, they're gonna bring me a great show, okay? But if they, but if, but if Kiss doesn't bring it, I'll, I won't have any problem walking out. Let's just the hope the they. Show. Let's just hope the opening act gets a more bit more time than than they did over here in Sweden, because the opening act over here was pretty hot new band, but they only got. I don't think think they played half an hour. Yeah. That was Night Flight Orchestra. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah, that's correct. <clears throat> well, yeah. if it happened, if it happened, hour, it'll be like three songs. <clears throat> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. If, if if they play what well, uh Starlifter, that's 18 plus yeah. minutes. I mean, mm -hmm. th that's definitely into the rush territory. But you know, Black Crows are getting 60 opening for Aerosmith. Um oh, nice. but again, they're a very much established band, so mm -hmm. you know, that's more mm -hmm. of a co-billa rather than an opener. All right, let's get into Psycho Circus. Mm -hmm. 25 years seems like just a moment ago that we were all excited about the prospect of a reunion album. I want you to go back in time to 1998 and what your hopes and aspirations were for Psycho Circus. Say nothing about what was delivered, but what were you hoping for the most 
Lonnie, you know, when it, they announced that they were going to go into the studio in early 1998? You know, I, I was 17, 18 years old, I guess. So I was, you know, I, I was just so all in on Kiss at the time. Not that I'm all not all in with Kiss at, at now, but I mean, I was just really at a at a high point and a at one of my more peaks of fandom at the time. Yeah, I'd, I'd seen them twice on the reunion tour. It was so great seeing the original four back together. Um, both the shows I saw were were absolutely incredible. Two of the best Kiss shows I've ever seen. And you know going into it knowing that they're going to do an album together before they tour again you know i you know i had high expectations i you know was really looking forward to it had high hopes and we and, and just telling myself it's going to be great i know it's going to be great you know those two shows i saw were fantastic now they're going to do an album you know you know and i remember them talking about you know picking up where love gun left off and 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 things like that and my expectations were sky high and I and I kind of told myself, you know what? I knew there'd be a formula for it. And we'll probably get into that a little bit. Uh, you know, I knew there'd be a basically a formula that we'd get we'll, that it will get one Ace Fairly. I thought we'd get one Ace Fairly song. I, I I did. I thought we'd get one Peter Chris song, and I thought it would be a ballad. Um, I I really did. I I didn't think we were gonna get like. The 1998 version of Getaway or something like that. I, I thought the Peter Chris song we were going to get was going to be a ballad. I knew it would follow. Yeah. I knew it would follow a certain type of formula, but my expectations for it were sky high. Couldn't have been more excited. You know, I've told the story on the show before. You know, I didn't go to class that morning. I was in college. I didn't go to class. I had to go get the album the moment it came out at Best Buy. Was so excited. Just couldn't couldn't have been more excited for. Daniel, what about you? Um, I have to say that I didn't feel what Lonnie was feeling. I, I, mm. My expectations were <laughs> at an uh, all-time low, pr pretty much, because uh, my version of the band really was with Eric Singer and Bruce Kulick, and I loved what they did live and in the studio for the most part. They didn't get to do a whole lot of records, but... I enjoyed Revenge, and there were some high points on on Carnival of Souls, but they always played well, and they always sounded good live, and so on. So when seeing Kiss on the reunion tour, I felt they had lost something. I might be the only one, but 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 I remember being kind of disappointed in the way the drumming sounded, and and Ace was of course sloppy, but when when you were used to Bruce Kulick, it was kind of kind of a big difference in some 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 of the songs. So. And Ace really, he hadn't done anything since Trouble Walking, I guess, back in '89. Um, nothing worth mentioning, at least. Uh, uh, and Peter Chris, same thing. He, he hadn't really, uh, you know, did done anything in the studio. I guess that Cat Cat album came out in '94, and that was it. So, so my expectations were pretty low. However when they dropped that video for psycho circus my expectations became a bit higher because i really enjoyed that song little did i know that peter chris was nowhere near that song and <laughs> not even ace freely was on that song uh, i thought uh, you know back then i wasn't that old either so i thought well, maybe peter chris picked it up and i think the solo on psycho circus sound sounded very ace freely um, and I still think it's kind of a good Fraley ripoff. Uh, but uh, when the album landed, uh, I guess Psycho Circus uh, was head and shoulders over the rest of the songs. So yeah. that's it. In, in 1998, I was a doughy eyed moron. I thought that they were going to open up the cupboard, go into the Fortress of Solitude, and bring out the blueprint to this is an original lineup kiss album and we're going to record it like we're the monkeys and we all live together and sing kumbaya mm -hmm. before dinner um, Same. so i thought that it was going to be gene simmons on bass and vocals peter chris on drums 
and vocals, Paul Stanley on rhythm guitar and vocals, and Ace Frehley on lead guitar and vocals. And yeah, I look back to the review that I wrote at the time <laughs> saying this is some of Peter Chris's best drumming in years. <laughs> And I just cringe. Um, but I was excited because to me, they had sacrificed a good band to do this. And I thought that they were going to make the most of it. Ken? Yeah, I'm kind of with you guys. Uh, <laughs> the, the deal is, I always thought they should have, you know, released an album right upon the release, um, upon the reunion tour you know right as the tour started i was hoping for that at that time but it didn't happen so i was happy they were finally gonna do, you know do an album together and yeah i was like everyone else thinking that yeah the four of them are gonna all be on there there's no need to have anybody else be on, on there at all you know why they can all play their instruments you know you know they played them on the tour so mm -hmm. I thought, you know, they should be able to do this. Um, uh, and I was excited too about the first song, you know, like like Daniel hearing Psycho Circus, and of course, yeah, not knowing, you know, th yeah, thinking that that's an Ace. It does sound like an Ace solo. Um, <laughs> and then finding out later that it wasn't, it's like, oh my god, and that that kind of tore the album down for me. Finally, you know, once you hear heard about the. That they all weren't playing it's kind of just brought everything down to even that you think you know, oh it made it a it's already already a disjointed album uh, uh musically in my opinion um though i played it today and i thought you know ah, it's not so bad it's not as bad as i thought it was mm -hmm. you know i still and i kind of enjoyed it you know even the bad stuff i did skip uh you know the the ballad, <laughs> but uh, I, I don't know. It, I was excited about it. I was hoping for the best, but obviously, you wanted the best. I wanted the best. the best. I did not get the best. <laughs> You're shit out of luck. <laughs> All right, Mark. I saved you for last. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> when it when it first was announced, um, here we have a radio station here. I mentioned it a few times called Q107. And they're the big Toronto station here. And I love them and I hate them because they have a tendency of doing this thing where when Rush releases a record, they always say, I hear through the grapevine, this next Rush album is going to sound like moving pictures. They always say that whenever a Rush album comes out and it never does. Okay. And they have a tendency here or did back in the day that whenever they refer to something new for Kiss, the DJ always said, God, I hope it sounds like Destroyer. God, I hope it's... And when they, when they said that, me, I immediately cringed. I was like, no, please, God, no. Don't let this... And I was trying to find out, too, like, who was going to produce it. I was, you know, the rosary was out. Please, God, no Bob Ezrin on this one. And then when I found out that Bruce Fairburn was going to do it, the light kind of started like, ah, okay, because I didn't mind Bruce Fairburn. So, I and I, you know, I saw them on the reunion tour. And I, I had a good time. I, I have said it numerous times at that tour. I, I thought they, I think they did, they did very good. You know, even my friend who didn't like Peter Chris at all as a drummer, and he's one of those anal, retentive drummer guys, thought that Peter Chris did great and was the MVP of the show that we saw in Toronto. Okay. So when they said that they're going to make a record, you know, I, I thought that they were going to do it all four of them again because, you know, and, but I wasn't expecting anything fantastic. Okay. The truth be told, they 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 play good together, but when this is not Dream Theater, okay, these guys are pretty much you know, you know, their 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 level, their skill level is minimal, okay, these guys. So, oh come on, you're making a really you're going to compare Gene Simmons bass playing to John May Young or Getty Lee? Like they're I'm not, not comparing them, but they're okay? it's it's a different type of bass okay. But playing. I'm saying like I'm saying that, but but going into a studio. And playing live are two different elements altogether. Okay. And at this time, it, this is not 1970 anymore. Okay. This is now people are expecting a little bit more, you know, higher quality of performance, I'm guessing, than they did back in the 70s. Right. 
you know, we have all kinds of click tracks and this and that you have to follow rigidly now. But you know what? When they did the record, I was I wanted to hear what it was. I was I was definitely excited. When I heard Psycho Circus, I thought, hey, this is pretty good. I was actually happy with Psycho Circus. I thought the song was good. I thought that it sounded great. But my friend immediately put a damper on it with me, the drummer guy. He was listening like this. He was like this, sitting beside me, didn't say a word through the whole song. And then he looked at me after, and I'm let God strike me down with lightning if I'm lying here. He looked at me after it was done. He goes, there's no fucking way that's Peter Chris on drums. And that's the first thing he told me when, when it was done. I go, what do you mean? And he goes, that's Peter for sure. He goes, no way, man. He goes, that drum fill before the solo? Peter Chris has never done a drum fill like that. That ain't Peter Chris. He right away, he knew. I didn't believe him for months when, when he said it. And he knew right away. He goes, that drum, goes, that ain't Peter Chris. Peter Chris is very... You know, one trick pony. This is I'm hearing stuff here that he never did on on his performances before. So, you know, on one hand, my my expectations were hopeful because of you know Bruce Fairburn. The first single was good, but you know there was a needs of needs for need of concern because of what just like what Lonnie said, you knew there was going to be an A song, right? And you knew there was going to be a Peter Chris song because they wanted to really show the band unity. But then again, when you hear that, you're like, oh shit. What album has a thing like that? You know, well, rock and roll over. That's a good album. But then, you know, it, when when Lonnie said that, you know, a ballad from Peter Chris, you can't help but think of Destroyer, right? So I'm like, shit, hopefully it's not gonna be a ballad. <coughs> but you know, it was a ballad and what what can you do, right? Well, is it possible? One one question before we get into the ranking, one final question. Is it possible, Lonnie, to separate what we found out later with what we thought then when talking about this album? That was their 25th anniversary in 1998, for all intents and purposes. And here we are 50 years now. Um, we, we know it was typical Kiss bullshit, smoke and mirrors, because it's all the we've had 25 years of the internet and just about everything has been unmasked to do with the band but back then you know they were still selling a line that this is a reunion album we've never been better and then we find out that it's not and it really soured the my taste for the album for years especially with those same things of everyone immediately a, a lot of people obviously have better ears and you know kind of attention to the detail of the signature of ace and peter than than i had um ruined the fucking album for me and i wasn't able to listen to it with clear ears and mind so are you able to no no i'm not as as much as the last time i spoke i talked about how excited i was for this album how I was at a peak of my fandom, you know, ditching class to go get it. I couldn't have been a bigger Kiss fan than I was at the time. Um, and then shortly thereafter, when things started surfacing on <coughs> the FAQ or Kiss Asylum, or wherever you, you know, went It was online. the Asylum's fault back then. Thank you. It, I think it was the Asylum's <laughs> fault back then, actually. But... Um, Wherever you went at the time, you started hearing rumblings that it wasn't Ace and Peter, and I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to believe it. So I said, "No, that's not true." You know, I've read some other bullshit on this site that you know this is just more bullshit. It's just Kiss fans complaining because they're not happy. Some things haven't changed, and. Um, <laughs> You know, I didn't want to believe it. So I loved the album initially because I didn't want to believe it. And I just I just set that aside. Like, no, it's not true. These guys, the four of them were playing. The four of them did this album. That sounds like Ace Frehley to me. And as time went on and I um, accepted the truth, it sounds like something out of Star Wars. So you decided to accept you it. You can't handle the truth. <laughs> you can't handle I couldn't handle the truth in 1998. I didn't want to handle the truth. Um, but as much as I loved that album when it first came out, it has become unlistenable to me because I feel like it's because I was so excited, I was so duped into belief, into being force fed something that 
no, this is us. We know everything's great. And the four of us are getting along so good. We couldn't be happier. And that was all bullshit because behind the scenes was just nothing like what was being presented to us. I mean, I didn't even like the fact when, when I bought the album and I looked at it, I didn't even like the fact that Bruce Kulik co-wrote Dream It. I'm like, why, 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 why is Bruce, why is there a co-write for Bruce Kulik? He's not, I like Bruce Kulik, but he's not in the band anymore. I thought that was weird, but that ah, doesn't mean Bruce is playing on this though. Come on. You know, that'd be crazy. <laughs> no, not at all. So to me, it's, it's, I, it's still unlistenable to me. I, I, I have a hard time getting through it and we'll talk about this when we go through our rankings. Like, I got into the rankings like, oh, this is difficult because I have such, I have grown such disdain for, for this album and this time period, 1998, 1999. Daniel, how about you? I just, I just think the whole album is a testament to, the, to the huge problems in the Kiss camp. You know, getting the original band together. Uh, you should just have put them in a studio and forced them to play together to to produce something. But early on, I felt that this was it was more it it resembled more a late '80s album than a classic album. You know, you had some good Paul songs on there, and Gene just threw in whatever he had in in in, in the vault. You know. So whatever flew before. out of the blender or, that day or, yeah or in the sealer safe yeah so a lot of you know kind of crappy songs and a lot of leftovers and uh, and you could for a song like with him for example you 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 immediately understood that it was a leftover from i guess from the carnival of soul sessions because it sounded so carnival of soul ish mm -hmm. <clears throat> so uh, and everything from from the cover to 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 the songs, just I, I didn't like it. I didn't like it off the bat. Uh, so uh, I was greatly disappointed. Even though I didn't have high expectation, I I, I thought it was one of their weaker albums, almost uh, immediately. I, I, and I, I guess it hasn't changed a lot through the years Mark, for me. You were going to interject with something. Well, I was just going to say that for, for me personally, I, I've, I've never had a problem now. Like when I think about it now, um, like separating my thoughts from back then to now, I don't have a problem with this album about the fact that Ace and Peter didn't play on it. Because throughout the years, there's been many records that I've discovered, whether it was from, you know, some of my mentors that were teaching me how to be engineering at studios and stuff like let me in on some secrets on things about other albums that are definitely not with original members on it. And, you know, I'll never forget the day when somebody told me uh, that Scorpions records, like Blackout, that there's only two members of the band are actually on that. The rest of it, nobody, none of the people are on that record. But I still love Blackout, and I still love some of these other records that only have maybe one or two members on it. The problem with Psycho Circus is not that Peter and Chris, Peter, Chris, and Ace aren't playing on it. The problem is that the songs suck. For the most part, on it, that's the problem, you know, because if they if if they would have been on there, those guys with those same material, it wouldn't have made a difference. It would have still sucked, you know, if they were on there. They needed better songs. That was the problem. The only good songs that were on this record are "Psycho Circus" and "A Journey of a Thousand Years." That's it. Those are the only two songs that are good on this album, like really standout songs, you know. We Are One is complete shit. You know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of songs on here that are complete junk. We'll, we'll, we will get to the song. Yeah, we'll get there. But, we'll get there. But I'm just, but I'm just saying that there, but, but having Peter and Ace play on those songs wouldn't have made a squad of difference, in my opinion. They had yeah. songs. Peter had songs. Ace had songs. The business got in the way. Um, I'm forever colored because I've overcompensated in every single aspect of my KISS fandom, and I recognize that, people. Um, I have reacted to that, probably overreacted to looking back at that review that I originally wrote about that fucking album, <laughs> about Peter Chris's best drumming in years, um, and all of that, out of pure embarrassment, I have absolute hate for Psycho Circus. Mm -hmm. But 
in everything that we've learned in the 25 years since because of um, the number of people who've gone on podcasts and done interviews connected with the band, all the history that has been illuminated from numerous authors, um, just numerous information that we now have. I shouldn't be fucking shocked. Kiss has always been about smoke and mirrors, people. Mm -hmm. Kiss has always been uh, the wizard in the Wizard of Oz. Kiss has always been the Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey Circus. So the problem is here. It's not them. It's us as Kiss fans. We bought into some illusion <laughs> and we're the ones who then got to see behind the curtain and are now upset about it. So um, again, I overcompensate. Ken, can you judge it honestly? Yeah, I mean, today... I judged it honestly. When I was listening to the album, I was just listening to the music. I wasn't listening about, oh, I know so and so plays guitar on this one and Alan Schwarzberg plays all the drums. You know, I wasn't listening to that. I was just listening to the sound of the music. Uh, and that's about it, you know, the music and the sound of it, um, which for the most part sounded okay. Um, there's a couple of real stinkers on there, yeah. But uh, it's not as bad as I don't think Mark says it is. <laughs> um, oh, man. It's not as bad as that, Mark. But, uh, yeah, there's a lot of other songs. Obviously, they left that they could have put on there, and we're going to get to that, that they did record. Or had, there's demos um, that is like, well, whose decision was that to – Put those on. Is that the producer? Bruce. Maybe the producer screwed it up. Maybe it's the producer's fault. Kind of like, you know, Bob Ezra and Mark. Maybe Bruce Fairbairn screwed it up and didn't pick the right songs. And he w couldn't control That's not what I heard. He couldn't control them. Wow. Well, I heard someone can't, is, I heard can't, someone can't, can't ask him now, back right? Pocket. I heard someone was in Bruce's back pocket. Oh, okay. Jesus. Well, it was safe. Look at his A, B, and C list. Say everything about the songs that he was he had to choose from for those sessions. And really, when you look at all three of those, it's lists, my life. None of them are appealing. What but the hell? He, he also was not the boss. Don't ever forget that line is mm -hmm. bullshit. That's what I'm saying. It's really, Paul there. Stanley. Gene Simmons but, was the boss of this album. Yeah. Uh, well, let's get yeah, into the was. ranking. Let's get into the rankings. I don't because think so. <laughs> you know, we can continue the back and forth as we go along through these. So, as yeah. usual, everyone has ranked the songs <laughs> on the album from their least favorite to favorite. And we're going to start at the bottom here. Um, and I don't think anyone's going to be surprised that the least favorite song on Psycho Circus is I Finally Found My Way. It managed to garner a grand total of eight points and was the least favorite of three of the five panelists. So, Ken, let's start with you. I finally found my way. Finally found my way. Yeah, it was my it was last on my list, obviously. Uh, just a horrible song. And that, and that I agree. It's, it's not a good song. Not the right song for Peter. Just because it's a metal song doesn't mean it's good. They forced that one out, you know. Paul and who did he co-write with? Um, Bob Ezrin. Bob Ezrin. Yeah, they. they of course. They, of of course. course. Yeah, that's that's a bad combination right there. The two of them writing that that song together. So, uh, just just not good. It really is really. I'm surprised it made the album. Really surprised. Daniel. No, it, it was last on my list. Uh, just a forced effort. Uh, nowhere near the classic uh, material. Like, even though. Uh, don't like Beth a whole lot. It, it's a whole lot better than this one. So it's yeah. just crap. <laughs> Mark, this is your one opportunity to talk about your favorite person. Well, really, are, are you surprised that anything that he touched is going to be in, in any other position except the very bottom of the list? I mean, come on. I mean, I think right now, wasn't he like worried about a computer company at this point yeah. while, he, while this is happening? So I think his, his mind was definitely elsewhere, you know, and good for Bob that he's probably wasn't, he, the, the cocaine days are probably long gone and dead at this point. And he was more focused on computer business. But, you know, if you, if you want to have somebody involved in writing a song, 
he, 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 I don't know, understand why he wasn't more honest about it and say, listen, guys, I'm just, my mind just isn't there for this right now and got somebody else to write it with them. I mean, I'm sure they could have got somebody else to do it. Would it, would it have been much better? I don't know, because, you know, usually most people say, except me, that Bob, Ezrin, and Kiss make some kind of gold, like, you know, Beth and these other songs that are on Destroyer. But, you know, it didn't work out in this situation. Maybe maybe Paul and him just don't write well together, which I find hard to believe, because I didn't they also get involved with the they title track, too. Yeah. yeah, so... Hmm. Maybe it's just a well, bad day. A bad I, did not, day. I, I refuse to put this song last because there are songs I despise more than this. But this is a song that now illustrates everything that's wrong with this album because of the issues that were going on with Peter and Ace, uh, according to one side of the camp. Uh, it's like Paul Stanley got together with Bob and said, let's write a song that's better than Beth for Peter to sing. Let's out Beth Beth. <laughs> but what they forgot was that was Peter in essence, with Bob bringing something to the sculpting of it. So it's a caricature. It's a joke. It's a laughable song. It shouldn't have been on there, but I can understand Peter singing it because he wanted to sing a song on the album, but it, it's more of an insult. And the fact that it's on the album is an insult to Peter Chris and his legacy with the band. Lonnie, you didn't have it as your least favorite either. I, I did not. I, there, there is a, I had it my second least favorite. There's a song on there that I despise more than finally found my way. And but I I echo Julian's sentiment that I, I think it's a disgrace that well Peter we're not going to accept any of your songs or um, you know e even the songs that you brought in Peter well let let's work on them maybe maybe we don't like them but let's tweak something here let's work on something here you know let let's let's make sure you get a a write on this a, a, you know a writing credit on this album. Let's take what you have and you know, maybe let's rework it a bit or tweak it a bit or 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 bring in or bring in Bob Ezrin to 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 do something with it like they did with Beth, you know, and and make it into something instead of saying, ah, you know what, Peter, the songs you brought in not good enough. Here, I wrote this ballad. Here, you sing the ballad because that's your role, and that's basically what it is. And I and I'm with Julian. I think it's crap. Know your role. Yeah, no, they should, they should, so I, and I agree with Lonnie, you know, uh, they should have taken, if, if Peter's ideas were that bad, they should have handed Bob the tape and said, make something of one of these ideas, um, mm -hmm. you know, and refined it and use that foil. If you're, if you're going to be, you know, that bl copycat blueprint for, for that, it, it, it was just so wrong. And I can't believe it was like a single in Sweden as well. So, all right. <laughs> Daniel. The, 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 the album went to number one over here as well. First yeah. one, ever, first Kiss album ever to make it there. Most dedicated fans in the world. Bless you, little hearts. Um, <laughs> moving on into 10th place on 13 points, a substantial jump. The second least favorite song on the album, Lonnie, you wanted the best. Oh, it is <laughs> dreadful. <laughs> I, I could not rank finally found my way to you below you wanted the best because it is absolutely the most forced thing I've ever heard in my life. I mean, talk about and, and it, it, it represents everything that's wrong with this album because it's just the kumbaya that everything's so great. We hear and we obey. The fans want us to play, you know. Here's the four of us like singing, like like Julian said, like we're the monkeys living in the same freaking house is what it is, is what it sounds like. It it and it is a microcosm of everything that's wrong with this album. And then it ends with the band joking around and laughing because everything is so freaking rosy. It is, it is, it is, it is, it is a snapshot of 1998, is that song. It's everything that's wrong. So, so Lonnie, uh, did, did, this, did this song really bother you that badly? Also because of the fact that when you first heard this album, you're like, see, look at how good these guys are together. They, they, they sound so happy together now. 1,000%, you know? Mark. 1,000% <laughs> correct. Is because it represents, it, 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 it was part of my buy-in. Like, oh my mm. gosh, what a song. You have all four members of the band singing on one track that's never happened before where you have the four of them sharing lead how cool is that 
we get a cool Ace Frehley solo in the middle of it. You know, it, it, it's part of what I go back to at the beginning that I was me and and the Kiss Army was duped by this whole album, and this song is a is is just the snapshot of everything that was wrong with the band in 1998, 1999. Well, at least it had a nice solo on it. Um, Daniel. It did, it, that was the one Ace Frehley, or one of the Ace Frehley solos, but hmm. that's about it. Yeah, I think the the cool thing is that the four of them are singing lead. I think that was kind of a fun idea. But other than that, there's nothing to like about this song. It was second to last uh, on my list. And uh, I think those two songs that we've gone through now are clearly worse than the rest. These two are real stinkers. Uh, there's some uh, high, high notes on most of the others, but these two shouldn't ever have been on the album. Yeah, the math actually agrees with that statement um, because after this, it's a substantial points jump and things start really separating. I had this second least favorite as well. Um, number one, the fake English accent at the end of it. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, also the monkeys kind of kumbaya bullshit. Um, I never liked this song, even after I found out what, about what an abomination this album was in terms of its uh, lineage. Um, never liked it. It was just so contrived to even have a song called You Wanted the Best with the band's intro. It, it's like, come on, guys, really? That's all you can think of? You wanted the best? And then that drivel? Utter tripe. Um, Ken. <laughs> You're the only one that gave this thing any real points. Yeah, I, I put that Mr. seven. Mr. I mean, I put that seven just just because of uh, I gave him an A for effort, but an, an F for execution. <laughs> um, it, yeah, it's it was a good idea, but not a good idea at the same time. Um, I like the fact that they're trying to get everyone involved on it and do the song, uh, but. It, you know, Gene reworked one of his old songs that probably shouldn't have been reworked. You know, it wasn't a, it's lots of times, some lots of times they work, you know, later on, but this time it didn't work. Um, and they should have, you know, put something else in this place on the album instead of this. So, yeah, it was, it was forced. Mark. Well, you got, you know, how you said that there, that these two represent. <clears throat> the bottom of the barrel I, I agree that, that this one is, is is horrendous i mean the the whole the whole the thing that bothers me the most about this is that all those kind of gene lines that are in there like the people wanted us to play and we hear them there we obey that 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 line's always bothered me because that's all a bunch of horse shit you know he doesn't give a crap about you know what the fans think it's been very evident throughout the years that he doesn't give a shit what people think anymore so and even back then i think that his his you know, caring was out the window, and you know, re reworking one of his songs. Maybe it shouldn't have been reworked. I think that's what should be said about most of this album. That a lot of the stuff shouldn't have been reworked. Period. It's just complete tripe. But there's, you know, there's a song with, I think that's worse. As I had it like ninth. I didn't have it second last. I had one that I think is far worse than this one. I'm sure we'll get to that when it gets well, there. But we will. <laughs> that 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 song is just you know. Oh, I'll save it for that. All right, let's move on. In ninth place on 21 points within Daniel. Yeah, I had it in ninth, in ninth place. And uh, within is, as I mentioned previously, so Carnival of Soulish. Uh, it shouldn't have been on this album. It was so evident immediately that this was a leftover. And... Uh, it's supposed, I guess, to be the, the heavy, mean Gene song. Uh, doesn't mean work Gene. like that at all, you know. Mean Gene, the, what's that the guy on from yeah, Pro Wrestling? Mean Gene Okra. Mean Gene, the dancing machine. Yeah, pro, okay. Oh, that's another guy. Yeah, okay. So uh, <laughs> it, it doesn't really work as the hard, heavy Gene song. Uh, and it's not that good. And it's kind of slow. It's kind of resembling... That song, what's it called? I'm an animal, I'm a snail. That slow song mm -hmm. off of I'm a snail. I'm a snail. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a snail. 
<laughs> my, girl, animal my, there. my girlfriend gave it that name. We heard it live. Said, what the hell is this? I said, it's a, it's, I'm an animal. I'm a snail, she said, because it's so slow, <laughs> sluggish song. Good. And, and this, so this, slow. This, kind of a, this is kind of a similar song. I don't like it. It's a song in need of a tempo. Yep. Uh, Ken, you actually ragged this one. I'm, I'm actually, you're handing in your gene card for where you put this song on your list. Wow. <laughs> I put it at 10. Yeah, because Ten. the fact that wow. it's, it's, a, it's a, probably an okay song for Connor of Souls. Right, it's, it may be a leftover from there, but well, it, it's it's definitely does not fit in with the rest of the music here. That's why I put out the bombs. Like it shouldn't have even been. That's why I said this this album is so disjointed. The type of music that's going on from this, you switch from this, and then you go to that, and it's it's all over the place. Um, so I, that's a to me, it's producing. That's that's a bad producing job. Um, but you know, you have what you you know, I guess, to choose from uh, as far as songs too. So, but uh, yeah, that's that's just I don't hate that song. It's not one of my favorites anyway, but uh, it just doesn't fit on it. That's why it's low for me. Well, Lonnie likes it. I do. Relatively speaking, relatively speaking, I like it because there's a lot of shit that's worse than this on this album, <laughs> and I think that although within doesn't really jive with the rest of the album it definitely sounds different from really anything else on there i think there's a lot bigger turds on this album than within um amen i i think that i i think that it's okay it's an okay it's it, it's okay it's not it's not great but it's okay um but i i ranked it fifth on my list because i think there's I just think there's a lot more crap on here that within by default um, ranked a little higher for me. I mean, really, when I started doing this list, I ranked Psycho Circus number one, and then I go, oh, what's number two? This is tough. I mean, it, it, got, it, got, really, it got really hard really quick. Yeah. So <laughs> that being said, it, 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 some songs had to land somewhere, and within land a little bit higher because I think it – by default, just outrank some of the other crap. Well, Mark is the fanboy of Within on this panel. Mm. Wow. See, see, but the thing is, I, I ranked it. I have to agree with Lonnie because the way I started, what I did, made, made my list was like this. Psycho Circus was going to be number one, hands down. Number tw 11 was going to be if I finally found my way for sure, for me. Okay. But then instead of going from one to what's number two, I did my list from the down, from the bottom up. Okay, so what else is shit? This is shit. This is definitely shit. This is shit. This is garbage. <laughs> and then by the time I got to within, it was up to number four. Because to me, honestly, by default. Yeah. But, but yeah, it's within, not quite as shitty as the one before it. Right. it yeah. by, by default, I ranked it where I did. I'm yeah, exactly. It. And and that that and for me, after I looked at my list and I thought about it, to me at least, I know Julia might not agree with this, but. I think Within is Gene's second best song on this record. After Journey of a Thousand Years, it's probably the only other song that he has that's decent in here. And I remember the first time I heard it, that that whole backward guitar thing, I was like, oh, that's that's pretty cool. That, that caught my ear immediately when I heard that being a guitar player, right? But then when it kicked in, I was like, whoa, wait a minute. It really sounded like, like Lonnie said, that this is like off of another album. And see, this is the whole problem with the record. Is that there is no consistency with anything on this? You have a, you know, a, you have this valid, you have this grandiose song that Gene does at the end of the record that's fantastic. You have a brilliant opener to it, and then everything in the middle is just kind of like, you know, they didn't know what the hell they wanted to do for the rest of it, you know. And the, the things are getting picked here and there, and just put all over the place. There's no rhyme or reason for it, you know. And and by by thinking of it that way, within to me just kind of stood out a little bit more as being a you know at least it was a bit of a rocker it had a cool distorted guitar sound to it you know i thought gene sang it pretty good you know so by just like with lonnie by default it ended up in number four so psycho circus is actually musical vomit according to mark yeah little pieces of corn there's a string of spaghetti some liquids yeah. some acid <laughs> you know a little bit of everything that nasty um i have this is my least favorite song hmm. on the album 
Oh, wow. And it's pretty down at the bottom of the barrel um, in terms of the full Kiss catalog. It is a shit sandwich that shouldn't have been anywhere near this album. It, you can see why it was left off Carnival of Souls, because it was too shitty even for that album. Um, it is just garbage. When I heard it live, I was like, really? There are much worse, better worse songs that you could have been performing live other than that. And then they repeat it with I'm an animal. Uh, yeah. So clearly mm -hmm. they have never learned. This is everything wrong with this album in one song. It is like, where is the producer saying, Gene, this is shit. Where are the other band members saying, Gene, this is shit. Where is Gene actually listening to it and saying, actually, this is shit. You know, th this is just when you have too many yes men around you, you end up with, within on a Kiss album. See, Julian, but don't you remember that interview that was done? I think it was one of those those Kiss magazines that came out, those special ones, where Paul Stanley actually said that he went back into the studio after to remix this song because he didn't like the way Bruce Fairburn had done it. And he actually said during that interview that Bob, Bob, Bruce and Gene were very, very tight and chummy on this record, that a lot of the times he thought that Gene's stuff was taken more into consideration than his stuff was. I remember the magazine clear as day when he said that. Yeah, and then you've heard Body and Soul, and you can actually see why Within makes the album. Wow. Is, yeah. <laughs> none, of the, none of these guys were taking steroids for their performance no. for this album. This was all dialing it in. But, you know, let's continue the celebration of Psycho Circus. Um, <laughs> in, in eighth place. Do you think we're going to get colored vinyl for Psycho Circus here in a couple of weeks? <laughs> God, I, 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 I hope not. Picture this. 25, 25th anniversary. Yeah. I'd like a refund. Um, <laughs> eighth place on 23 points. So only marginally better is In Your Face. Yeah. On Mm, I ranked In Your Face 7th. I ranked it a little Middle. bit higher. Not not a huge fan of it. I think there's worse songs on the album that made the album than In Your Face. I know Gene wrote it for Ace, which again, I don't really freaking understand because you can't tell me Ace Frehley brought in one song. Oh, and it's, and it's another example of Finally Found My Way to You. Oh, here, Ace. Sing this because I wrote this and I'm the better songwriter. I'm superior. So here, sing this song. <laughs> that being said, I do have it a little bit higher because I do think there's shittier songs on this album than In Your Face. And I just kind of like an Ace Fairly song, song. You know, it, it was just a different change of pace a little bit. but And it was nice to hear Ace sing lead. So I ranked it a little bit higher. I, I enjoy it more than the stuff, some of the stuff that made the album. But I don't like the fact that Gene wrote it because it's just kind of kind of stupid that you're you're. And it was part of the what was the problem with the band is that you're you're telling Ace and Peter you're not as good as us. Yeah. No, and you you also have Paul Stanley telling Peter this is what a Peter Chris song should be like, and this is Gene telling Ace Fairly what an Ace song should be like, or throwing him a throwaway um, vocal. So I echo Lonnie's sentiments, and I actually have it right next to I finally found your way exactly for the same reason. Daniel, in your face. Uh, I think Lonnie hit the nail on the head. Um, I have to agree with everything he said. It's even in the seventh place on my list. Um, a lukewarm song, but it was real fun to hear Ace doing the lead vocals. I think that's the the gist of it, you know. Yep, Ken. Yeah, just to be clear, this song is not on the Ameri you know U.S. release. It was on the Japanese uh, release, and maybe some other ones. I I got it on this one here, which is a Japanese CD hmm. version. Uh, Ooh, back when it came you've out, you've got the 3D pop-up cover. You're a sucker. I do have the 3D. Yeah, I'm a sucker. How many? That. How many copies of Psycho Circus do you own, Ken? <laughs> Not that many, really. <laughs> Maybe four or five. Ten. Really? Too many. <laughs> Too many, probably. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, mine is low for that one. Also nine. I, I don't like the song. I mean, it's simple as that. It's just nothing about the verses or the chorus stand out as. Oh anything catchy to me. Um, and so that just like striked it for me. Uh, it's just kind of a song that goes along and not, nothing happens. It's kind of one of those types uh, of songs. So that's why it's so low for me. 
So Mark has his middle of his list, which clearly means really? that it's not as shit as I finally found my way, and it's not as good as, but it's shittier than Psycho Circus. Right, Mark? Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, <laughs> the reason why it ranked where it ranked is because I, like Ken said, this is not on the U.S. release of the album, right? And really, I was always just listening to that version of the record. Only, you know, more recently, and, not, and I don't mean like yesterday, but like more recently when I did discover that there was another song on another version of the record, I started to hear it. So this song to me is relatively newer to me. So whenever I hear this song, I kind of like go like, eh, you know, it, it, it piques my interest a little bit more because I'm just not used to it as much as a, the other Psycho Circus songs because it's just not on a copy of the record that I listen to, right? And again, with Ace singing it, I think also kind of helps it because it's, you know, it's something that's kind of rare. You don't get too much Ace on this record. So as soon as you hear him on there, you're kind of like, oh, okay, well, that gives it a little extra point. So, and again, it's more of a default landing again too because i mean when i was doing this i was like we okay this is shit this is shit and this was like kind of in the middle so i think it landed pretty decently i, I mean there's there's stuff that's you know definitely worse than this but you know there's a there's a few things better than it still yeah it's definitely in the the bottom half did i get everyone because i lost track with checking my text i think so yeah Okay, so moving on into seventh place, I'll go first on this one. Raise your glasses on 28 points. Um, I actually think it's catchy. I like the collector's mix that was on the single a bit better than the version on the album. But I really have a problem with raise your glasses because when they're doing a concert, and a live performance and Paul's doing now it's time to put on your glasses and they've got a song called raise your fucking glasses and they're not <laughs> performing yeah. it. Um, it just does not compute. So it's a catchy song. It's middle of the pack for me. It's okay. It's nothing special. It's a little bit contrived because of the 3d bullshit uh, that went with the tour. Um, Lonnie. Um, you don't like this very much. I don't. I think it. I think it's very forced. Actually, I, I, is it catchy? Sure, it's catchy, but I don't like it because Kiss isn't because because telephone. Um, because get that. Because you know, every interview I hear Gene Simmons say is like, "Oh, you know, Ace and Peter, drugs and alcohol, blah 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 blah," and then they put out a song called raise your glasses it's like really that, I, I, I don't know I, I, really R raise your glasses like yeah oh raise your glasses we're so great raise your glasses oh drugs and alcohol ace and peter what it doesn't make any sense to me i, I think it's 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 another song that's so forced and I keep go referring back to that a lot with with these with these songs is is forced Maybe standing they... proud standing proud because we're the champions. Look how great we are! Drugs and alcohol, Ace and Peter. Maybe they weren't talking about alcohol. Maybe they're talking about drinking <clears throat> a glass of milk or something. Mark, what's your glasses like? In the words of Ocho Cinco, <laughs> "Child, please." What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> Ken, I, I haven't heard a heard a ringtone like that since the 1980s. Right. Um, it's like Back to the Future. It's, no, it's, yeah, it's, or something. It was, it's like, I, was, I was waiting for the long cable to come from right. the wall. Yeah, it was like a, when the phone rang it was a red, it was, and it's like, answer me. It was a red It was a red blinking phone. It was a red blinking phone. You know, it's a back cable. The back cable, phone. Um, like when you're a kid and the phone rings and you're like, it's so phone, angry when it I, rings, you have to answer it. I tell the commissioner had to wait. Anyway, uh... <laughs> Uh, so this uh, song, I like it. It's I've always liked it, actually. Um, I, I don't know if it's forced. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not as forced as Tomorrow and Tonight. Um, but uh, I think it's a catchy. I like the verses. I like it. You know, it's kind of an anthem. It, you know, anthem. Maybe the only anthem besides, well, well Psycho Circus is not really an anthem, in my opinion. But it's the one anthem on the on the album, um, and I like it. I'm like, I had it at number three. That's how much I like it on this uh, on this record. I mean, it is catchy. 
real catchy. Well, Daniel, it's middle of the pack for you as well, isn't it? Yeah, I didn't analyze it as deep as Lani. Uh, <laughs> I, I, just felt, I, just, I just felt it was a oh, cool, cool sounding song, you know, a catchy song. Uh, not that rememberable, or, or it did. It wasn't really a standout. It, it kind of reminded me of something like "I'll Fight Hell to Hold You" or. Uh, mm. when your walls come down something off of crazy oh. nights that's decent you know not in the upper echelon or something but 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 it's pretty decent uh chorus that you remember and that's always good so uh, i put it at, at, at number five and then there's mark yeah um i'm a, usually a big paul stanley fan uh, and a supporter, but this is shit. I don't like this song. I never liked this song at all. I mean, every time when the, like, what the fact was when I was making my list here, okay, I had totally forgotten about this song. I was looking like, wait a minute, I still have a song missing. What song? Am I? And then I had to actually go to Discogs and go, oh, wait a minute, okay, uh, oh, raise your glasses, yeah. Ugh. And then I remembered that that was on here, and I had to you know find a spot for it. And I think eight is just. Just perfect for it. I mean, I, I, I have to agree with with, La, with Lonnie and with Julian with their points. I think this is by far a sort of like dial, you know, the phoned in song for Paul. I don't think this is anything strong on his end at all. I mean, really, when you compare this to Psycho Circus, I don't think there's even any contest at the quality of writing between those two. So I, I just never, never liked this song. Yeah, this album seems to have more of Doc McGee on it than an album should have. Of okay. someone just no, just someone spitballing ideas. Okay, guys, for this tour, we're gonna have a psycho circus <laughs> with toys and shit like this, you know. And and then we're gonna do 3D. So Paul, you you know, if you talk about 3D, 3D glasses, you do raise your glasses, you know. And <laughs> it, it's it just has a manager spitballing ideas, and the guys, okay, we're gonna write a song about, you know. So you end up with Psycho Circus. Um, in sixth place, on 30 points, Dreaming, Alice Cooper fans rejoice. rejoice. Mark, yeah, back to you, Mark. I'm 18. Um, I had this one higher than Razor Glasses. Um, it's, it's not bad. It's not great, obviously. Uh, there, like I said, there's nothing. There's only three songs, I think, that are really great on this album. And other than that, the rest of it is just mediocre to terrible. Uh, this is sort of like mediocre, I think. Uh, I've always had a kind of problem with that whole thing about the Alice Cooper thing. But, you know, it's so much like that. So, I mean, when I listen to it, I can understand it's just that little run up that they do. Da, 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 that, that little part there that kind of stands out. But, I mean, yeah. really, I mean, we're, we're getting that nitpicky <laughs> with, you know, notation that you're going to start suing for that. I mean, I'll tell you one thing. The first time I heard this song, the, the first thing that came into my head was not that this is Alice Cooper. Definitely not. So, you know, it, uh, to me, it's it's okay. It's it's not the worst thing Paul's done, but it's definitely not in his, you know, really good batch of songs that he's written. You know, it's like copywriting math to me, that little progression that they got him on. Um, Lonnie and Ken have this equally. So, Lonnie, how about you first? Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was, I was texting work. Mm. <laughs> so, I'm gonna, so, I'm, so, so I'm going to embarrass myself. I, I, no, I knew it to you because Ken was on mute. I'm sorry. I was texting work, so I'm sorry. What what song are we are we trashing right now? We're trashing dreaming. <laughs> We're no, celebrating dreaming. That's right. That's dreaming. Right. Dreaming is. I had it eight out of eleven. Um, oh. it is not my favorite. It's it's just kind of forgettable in my opinion, and that may, may, maybe I should have it higher because I did say it's forgettable when there's a lot of other crap on there that just stands out for being such crap. Mm. Um, but for me, it's just forgettable. It's it's close to the end of the album. It it kind of just feels like filler as we're getting close to Journey of a Thousand Years, and we needed another Paul song, so we threw this one on there that we kind of co-wrote with Bruce and Alice Cooper, I guess. And <laughs> here it is. It, it it's not memorable at. It's one of the least memorable Kiss songs out there, in my opinion. 
weekend. Yeah, dreaming. Um, yeah, I, I know the Alice Cooper thing. Mm -hmm. I never thought of that until they, you know, someone they mentioned it, and there was that lawsuit or whatever that was settled out of court or something like that. But uh, dreaming. Um, yeah, it's just this, it's this Paul Stanley song that he could have wrote in his sleep kind of song. Um, it's not one of his better tunes. Um, so that's why it's on the lower end for me at number eight. Yeah, I really like it. It's middle of the pack for me, but I really like Paul's vocal on this song as well. It's good vocal. Um, always liked it. I've never been able to make that connection with 18. It just doesn't connect in my brain as many times as I hear it. Um, it, it it's... I, I dig it, I, but I don't dig it as much as Daniel. It's his second favorite on the album. Wow. Or was when he filled out the form. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't really say that much because after Psycho Circus, there's uh, not that much that I listen to these days from, from this album. But but however, I do remember and recall the, the chorus from this song. I think it's a pretty strong chorus. And uh, if Paul wrote this thing in his sleep i kind of like songs that paul wrote in his sleep you know he, 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 you know <laughs> some of his stuff is pretty good and this is one of them you know it's like an once again an 80s song uh pretty strong chorus and as julian mentioned great vocals and if there's a pretty strong chorus and great vocals on a paul stanley song i kind of like it and uh, this is one of them i, I kind of like this one so uh I had it at number two, actually. Yeah. Wow. Hoorah. We're being positive about Psycho Circus. <laughs> Someone has to be. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to continue the positivity <laughs> because in fifth place, we are one, which I want to hate. It managed to get 33 points, but it is just so sickeningly wonderful. You know, it, it's everything that's wrong and everything that's right. It's, uh, it's yin and yang colliding. Um, no, I really actually like it. It's you know, we're in the into the top half of my ranking now. So, um, Lonnie, before you get texted again, sorry, we are one. Um, it's not bad in my opinion. There's there's a lot worse on here than we are one. I think it's it's Gene trying to be Beatle esque as much as we can and and. Trying to, I, I think Gene is a little bit humbled in writing this and that he remembers what kind of crowds he was playing to, in, especially in the U.S. in the early 90s. And then we, we put the makeup back on and, you know, we, we reunited with Ace and Peter and suddenly I'm on top of the world again. I think it's Gene being a little humble and, and thankful. Um for where he was at at this particular point in time. Um, I know Mark said earlier that we are one is shit and I'm probably going to hear about it here in a little bit and he'll tell me how crappy of a song it is. But I, I, I think it's, it's not bad. I think, I think there's worse on here than we are one if in my opinion. Okay. Before we get to Mark, let's go to Ken. Okay. What is it again? I, I was, <laughs> It's a, gene, no. it's, a, it's a gene song. We <laughs> no, no, no. One. We are what? Uh, no, we are one. I love. We are one. I think. I think it's pretty good. Uh, I'm like with you know with Julian on it. I think it's a nice catchy tune. Maybe it doesn't fit the album, uh, but it's it's a decent gene song. There's three decent gene songs on this album, um, but that that is. I always <laughs> thought it was. Pretty catchy, that kind of Beatles kind of thing, you know. Uh, writing, um, it would have fit on the solo album back in '78, maybe something like that. But uh, you know, it's 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 good. I enjoy it. All right, uh, Mark's going last. So uh, Daniel, yeah, uh, I thought Lana said that Gene only cared about. Money, money and didn't care about the fans and all that a few moments ago and now sure. he's like writing a song because I, 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 I think, by... <laughs> I think well, you're reading, I, I, I didn't say Gene didn't care about the fans I said that I said that <laughs> something like that I, I I said that that they were talking about drugs and alcohol are bad but we're writing a song about about raising your glasses a little bit ago yeah 
Yeah. But uh, you read a whole lot into the into the, the lyrics from from Gene. Oh, I think he well, just put he, he just put deep. things. He's pretty deep. Yeah, yeah, he's a deep <laughs> guy. Sure. No, uh, I have to say that we are one of so, it's it's a, such a silly song, so 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 silly lyrics. However, you do feel ah, uh, you can't really. I, I think it's cool at the same time. And it's often mentioned in in various, uh, you know, on the on the board in a sort of a funny way. I mean, it's so silly that it that it's kind of funny. It's it's kind of a cool song. And as as um, Ken said, something that could have been on Gene's solo album from '78, maybe. Uh, I think it's one of Gene's better songs on the album, and I had it. Uh, as number six on my list, I think it's a decent song. Kind of, kind of funny. Yeah, it's so contrived and cheesy. It's actually yeah. good. It's one of yeah, those. Like so everything that I've just criticized, raise your glasses for being. I'm now saying is okay when it comes to the <laughs> yeah. one. Yeah. Okay, Mark, bring us back down to earth. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, this is the second. Uh, remember when I said that there's a song that's worse than you wanted the best? This is the one. This song is just, I, I can't understand how you guys like this song. This is just the, the absolute silliest, most ridiculous song I've ever heard. And to hear Gene do it, wow. I mean, I just imagine him with this guitar smiling around this big circle of people holding hands and him strumming this acoustic guitar and singing this complete piece of crap. Okay, this is terrible. <laughs> We are one. Like, yeah, come on. Man. We are the world. And, and, the, and the guitar sounds are terrible on this. I mean, what the yeah, hell were they doing on this song? Uh, that's production. It's so shit. Like, it's that's your producer. But but the, but there again, it goes back to the songwriting. You could have you could have Ace and Peter play on this. It would still be as equally crap as it is now. Uh, okay. It's, I see you tonight. It's 20 terrible. Years later. No. Oh, you're right no. This last way. No way. See you, you tonight. Write this last? <laughs> no, I like the second last. <laughs> I, you I, like this better than you wanted the best? You got the best? I, no, he I like this. I, I like you I wanted the best better. Way. More than you this. You like it better than finally found my way? Yeah. Mark, what kind of turd sandwiches are you listening to? This is uh, awful. I mean, I finally everything, found my way is terrible. But yeah, but this, I'm telling you, everything down here at the bottom is the shit. There's nothing good on this record. <laughs> and the only thing that's good on this record are the, the first three on my list. That's the only so songs that are good. This, this is terrible. We, I don't know. I don't know any kiss. Destroyer fans. songs. Have we, have you know we what? Got a destroyer ranking? Honestly, <laughs> besides you guys, you're the only kiss <laughs> fans I know that like this song. No, I don't know no, any. No, they're only kiss fans. No, 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 no. I don't, no. In my circle, I don't know no, any other kiss, kiss fan that really likes this song. This terrible song. Several Kiss fans that really like. Okay, like I'm saying in my circle of, of people. No, they like the whole album. Is. There's I'm a lot of Kiss fans like the whole album. We're, we're not talking about Canadian circles right now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Hey, you know right. what? Canadian circles. US, yeah, USA, USA. Yeah. Well, that's a perfect on. segue oh, to get us back on track to the celebration <laughs> and a little bit of patriotism for Kiss Nation. Bonnie. Waving the flag. <laughs> right in fourth place on 37 points it's actually a tie but this mm. one comes up first and it's lonnie's second favorite song on the album he yeah. wants to pledge allegiance to the state of yeah. rock and wow. roll lonnie why again by default it's just my second favorite song on the album because like i said i started my list and i put psycho circus one i'm like ooh, what's <laughs> two um and it turned out to be a pledge allegiance just because it, it's it's a good, it's a decent song. It's it's better than a lot of the stuff on there. And, it, and it's halfway decent. And I think the band really wanted to play this live on the Psycho Circus tour. So much that like as soon as they had a chance to in 04 and Rock the Nation, they were playing this um, in Australia um, Im almost immediately with, with Eric and Tommy. I think they really wanted a chance to play this song live. And I, I just don't think it, it worked probably just didn't work out in rehearsals with, with Ace and Peter that, yeah, we're, we're not going to be able to put this together and pull this off. It's not, it's not a bad song. It's actually, it's, it's a very kiss like song. Wave your flag. Cause we're the champions pound your chest. Look, you know, it's a, it's a very kiss anthem like song. So because of that, it feels just more like a kiss song. I, I, I put it too on my list. For those reasons. 
Yeah, La um, Daniel also rates us pretty highly, considering relatively. Number four, number four. To me, it's like a sister song to Raise Your Glasses, but better. You know, better lyrics. Uh, uh, I think it worked well when they did it in Australia. In I don't know, it was a few years later. I think uh, they they played a few <laughs> times in Australia. I, I think it went over well and, and sounded great. I wish they have would have continued playing that song. <laughs> And as Lana said, the lyrics works as a Kiss song, and uh, it's one of Paul Stanley's songs that he wrote in his sleep, and it's really better than okay. I think it's one of the better songs on the album. Yeah, you know, Ken and I both have ranked this the same, middle of the pack, complete middle of this pile when it comes to the songs. I'm really thrilled that they actually did do it live at least once, so we got to hear what it would sound like. Uh, Ken? Okay, so <laughs> yeah, it's 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 middle of the pack for me, um, and it's I guess I didn't realize it. it yeah, it is kind of an anthem, um, but I had it at six. Uh, it's a good song, but not the greatest song. I think it's a good vocal performance for sure, though by by uh, Paul Stanley. I think that's a real maybe one of the stronger ones on the album for him. But uh, yeah, it's it's good middle of the pack for me. Um, you know, I, I enjoyed it today when I listened to it. Yeah, it doesn't sound like an easy song to sing, actually. You know, it, no, uh, it, it's vocally, it seems to me to be challenging. Mark, you also ranked this one, you know, pretty similarly to Ken and I. Yeah, I, I put it, I put it like number five, and th this is where the quality of the album starts to get better, in my opinion. Here, uh, you know. And right here, the, the comment that uh, I believe Julian and Lonnie were talking about, the fact that they played this on the 2004 tour, uh, you know, that, that that goes back to probably answering a question that we were talking about before. Why did Peter and Ace not play on this album? Well, maybe because they couldn't play this kind of material. You just said it yourself. You know they probably tried to play it on the on the reunion on the uh, Psycho Circus tour, and they weren't able to do it in rehearsals. It didn't go well because they can't play this kind of stuff. Okay, and that's why they weren't on there because it's it's not originals Kiss sounding stuff. Okay, but that's the, well, there you go. So then they're not don't they don't have the talent to play this sort of material. So they have to get other people in to do it, and. Look when 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 they got uh, Eric in and they got Bruce Kulick and they already got Tommy Thayer in there, no problem. They played the song and it turned out well. And I like this song. It, it is probably Paul's second, you know, best song on this record for sure. Uh, you know, and it's a little again very USA USA and it's a whole kind of you know lyrical thing. But you know, Americans are bullies that way sometimes. But wow, you know, so. <laughs> but you know, I I don't they, mind. The we song. out we yeah. outnumber you guys on this episode, so right. I get that there. <laughs> 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 no, I could just hear Peter Chris's voice saying, "I ain't playing that shit," you know. Yeah, so, you know. All right, let's move on. Uh, this was tied with "I Pledge Allegiance," um, but in third place on also on thirty-seven points, the mighty Ace Frehley and Peter Chris. Into the void, Daniel. Let's get started with you on there. Not a favorite of mine, but once again, it's always cool to have a Ace Frehley lead vocal on on the album. I had it at number eight. Uh, uh, nothing special to me. Nothing spectacular. Um, however, it's cool that it's actually the original band playing the song, but that doesn't really make it a better song. Much as one of you said earlier, even though, even if Peter and Ace had played this material, it would still kind of suck, you know. And that's to me, that's into the void. A pretty good song, nothing special, but it's cool to have Peter and Ace on the song. Yeah, Ken, you also have this again very much in the middle of your ranking in fifth. Yeah, five for it. Uh, I, you know, I enjoy the song. It's it's actually better than I thought. I might listen to it recently. I, I enjoyed it a lot more than I did when I first heard it. I thought, yeah, you know, it's kind of lower, you know, not that great. But, you know, uh, I've come to like it a lot more. The more I've, uh, the more time has passed and, and hearing it just recently, it's pretty darn good. I, I really enjoy it. 
Lonnie, you, you done waving your flag? You want to go into the void? Yeah, um, I <laughs> think into the, the void is is fine. Um, it, it's one of my, it's one of the better songs on the album. I do enjoy that it's the original band playing. Um, it's it's echo what Daniel said. You know, it, it was great to hear, the, um, you know, an Ace Frehley track that we've been waiting for, and an Ace Frehley solo in there. Um, it 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 kind of fits in the expect what expectations were for the album the original band playing ace fairly um hearing them it, it's 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 a shame we didn't get more of songs in this vein because that's what we signed up for yep no mark and i rank this equally um i rank it you know third because it is the originals but I think Ace had a lot better material in the 1990s. Take Me to the City, Cherokee Boogie, um, Sister, you know, Shaking Sharpshooters, we later heard. He had material, but this one has riffs. This one has guitars, and this has Peter Chris on drums. And maybe it is in revisionism that I rank it so highly as a result, but it really is the most Kiss-like song on the album in terms of its structure looking back at it so whether i can separate what i thought in 1998 with what i now know and feel um you know obviously being a green kool-aid drinker you know it's it's this is the one really honest song on the album so it ranks highly for me mark yeah i i, I gotta agree i got a number three and like i said th th there's three great songs on this album and to me this is one of them this one I think uh, has the, the, the spirit, the heart of what people wanted from this record, but never got in the rest of it. Um, but, you know, but with that said, too, while I really enjoy this song and, and I rank, rank it very high, I couldn't imagine having an album full of songs like this. I mean, it's, it's such a simplistic song and, you know, pretty easy song to play and, and and that's why probably i love it because in comparison to some of the other songs on here it's more down to basics and it sounds cool and it's you know kind of you know has a good vibe to it but i don't know if i would be would have liked having you know 10 songs of this kind of caliber on the record i think one or two is good you know kind of like how on dynasty they had like you know dirty living they had like one song like that on there and i think that's good you know uh but I, I like the song. I think I think Ace does a good job singing on it. Um, I, everything about it, I, I like. I mean, it's it's very high up on my list for that reason, uh, and it's something that I don't. I never would. I would never skip this song if if, I, if it came up, you know, on the radio or something. I would never turn it off. And maybe that should have been the instructions that they gave Bruce Fairburn. Here is Dynasty. This is the last album. Um, here are the songs we're bringing in. What do you think would be best as what would feel like a follow up to that album? Mm, yeah. Um, you know, and, and then get Bob Ezrin to help with the song craft. So, all right. In second place, it, it's really at this point, it's no, no surprise what's going to be number one. But Journey of a Thousand Years, I think, is rightfully in second place. Mm. Um, but Lonnie, it's very much middle of the pack for you. I don't love it. I, I know it gets a lot of praise and people think, oh, it, it's so good. And it's such a great bookend song because it's the same, you know, guitar solo at the end. And it's, um, you know, just like a like an ending chapter to the song. I I, I, I think it's, I don't love it. I, I think it's fine, but it's just, it, it is more middle of the pack for me uh, uh, with, with these songs. It's, it's different sounding than the rest of the songs on the album. That's for sure. And again, we talk about different sounding songs. The album is all over the place with different sounding songs. There is no unity. There is no structure to the album really, because every song just feels like, I don't know, like, like, like a different, like we're, we're just going to grab this. Yeah. And, okay. Okay. Here, here, here's punch. the album. Yeah. So it's, it's it's fine. I, I know some people like it, but it's it's not it, it's it's not something I ever go back and listen to or ever seek out. It's just there when you reach the I th end. I think I think it's over I think it's very overrated. Yeah, the song at the end of the album. Um let's see. Daniel, it's Mark uh Mark Ken and I are tied. So Daniel, why don't you go next with Journey? 
Yeah, I had it in third place. My favorite Gene song off the album. Um, however, it does reek a little bit of Gene Simmons' demo at times. I think this one. It, it's a little. It has a little stench attached to it. You can feel that it's something that you know Gene has. It hasn't really. It doesn't really fit the album. I think uh, because it's such a an oddball. However, uh, the vocals, Gene's vocals on this one are really haunting. And uh, there's something about the song. It, it fits as, as the final piece on the album to me. I think it's a good way to round off the album. Most of the times, they've just put the shittiest songs at the end. You, you have mm. just have to go to Animalize or some of these albums, Lick It Up maybe, and a few others. <laughs> what's left well we put that at the end but this time around I actually saved gene's best song for last and i think it's a good way to end the album but it's not one of my favorite gene songs of all time but on this album it's it's one of, of the strongest in my mind yeah for me it's a fitting coda you know yeah. it was before i realized that it tagged back to the intro and it's just a nice bit of ezrin-esque kind of storytelling that it brings the album full circle but gene's vocal on this is really really good and it's a very well crafted song um yeah it does stand out against the rest of the material on the album making it a bit scattershot hodgepodge whatever you want to call it potpourri um but it's kind of quirky and unique in terms of it, it gets somewhere that seduction of the innocent didn't quite reach on carnal of souls him reaching into a sonic tapestry that is very different and unfamiliar um mark you also have this up in number two yeah like I said, I really like the song. I mean, I remember the first time I first couple times I listened to this record. Um, I mean, I can just envision it now. I've, after listening to like, I finally found my way and dreaming and all these other like just complete ugh, tiresome material. They like, finally get to this, and you're like, ooh, okay. Then suddenly I was just like, my attention was recaptured again, and. It's it's so good. I I mean I know that for people like Lonnie may not be, you know what they may have hoped for, in the for the end of the record. But I I think that it it definitely showed a, a side of Gene that I, I enjoyed. I mean I'm not I've never been big on Gene's songs. I always find his material sort of very caveman. Me man, listen to me sing about women, you know, kind of stuff. And I, I find that this is very much more thought to it there's i really like the side of gene I, if he did more like this i think that i would have had much better respect for him as a writer in my opinion but it was it's such a great song i i definitely think it ends well and that the thing that's you know difficult is that because they put it at the end you have to go through all that other shit before it to get to it you know it's just unbelievable that you have to sit through all that just to get to this good song you know Team Gene, final <laughs> word on Journey. Yeah, it's this is best song on the album, obviously. Um, the only thing I, I always thought, though, again, I, I've said it before, I, I always thought it was missing one verse. It needed another verse. I just thought it always needed one more. Uh, I think it would have been even better of a mm -hmm. song. Uh, and maybe that's where the demo part comes in for Daniel or something like it. Yeah. There's something about it maybe not finished. I just thought it needed another set of uh, lyrics in the verse. So, but it, uh, even with that not happening, it's a really great song to end the album on. Um, yeah, everything in between Psycho Circus and that is should have been different pretty much. I think, again, the if Bob Ezrin would have produced this album, yeah. he would have kept it to a theme, kept it in, you know, and made it work. He would have made it work, I think. It would have been a lot different, probably. Oh, yeah. Done it. But I, I, th I think A Journey of a Thousand Years is best left feeling incomplete because, like a journey of a lifetime, is that life ever fully complete? You know, or would that oh. third verse be super famous for the message? Oh, philosophical. Yeah, yeah. If, if philosophically speaking. All right, so there's no surprise. I, it's unanimous. Psycho Circus is the best song um, 
on the album, according to this panel, 55 points. Can't do better than that. I very nearly had Journey as my top pick, and it was right up to the end where I, I punched yeah. it into the spreadsheet that I, I put Psycho Top, and it just is. It represents the album. It's the best representation of this album. It's a great song. I remember the excitement of hearing it. I, I don't actually mind hearing it now live in concert. Um, it's not as bitter as it once was. Um, Daniel, Psycho Circus. Yeah, Psycho Circus is a perfect opener. And as many times before, the first song on the album is the best one. Uh, I think this was a recipe they used for later albums as well. I think Monster had a great opener. I think Sonic Boom had a great opener. But other than those openers, those albums didn't do that a whole lot for me either. So unfortunately, after you know like revenge paul only managed to do one great song for each album i think and this was the great one for this for this album yeah wrat in new jersey leaked this song first and i remember it being one of the first mp3s ever got off the internet lonnie um as much as i trashed the album as we're going through it i do still like this song this song is the one listenable song to me really off the album that's it has stood that it is paul stanley talks about oh it's a classic it's a new kiss classic well this 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 song is a kiss classic and it lives up um to that title um it, it's very well done it's extremely well done i remember hearing it for the first time on the radio like a month before the album came out i was at work at the golf course and and it came on you know the radio station i just like had to stop what i was doing because i had to listen to it because i've been waiting so long for it um and, and and it's still good to this day i i really enjoyed it when they when they brought it back out of the catalog after ignoring it for several years um it's it's very good very well done um and it is so the test of time Ken. Yeah, I think I heard that leak that you're talking about. I remember hearing it. I was like, oh, this, you know, this album. I think awesome. it was Roth's Rendezvous had it linked. Yeah, that's right. I remember that. I remember that. So, yeah. And I was like listening to it over and over on, the, on my computer or whatever um, when that was leaked. But uh, yeah, that was cool. Um, and it is a rightly so great song. And that's why it's. Uh, being played, you know, in a lot of their tours um, since the album came out. So, real perfect, good song, great solo. The, the whole mood of the song is great. Mm -hmm. It's just nothing wrong about it. It's number one for All a right, reason. Mark, Mark does the cinematic type of music uh, with Project Gemini. You get the final word on Psycho Circus. Yeah, I, I love this song. Like I said, when I first heard this song, I had high hopes for this record. I, I really thought that it was going to be something really fantastic. But at least we have this song, you know, and, and they, they've continued to use it live. I mean, they've even opened shows with it. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. who would have thought that years later, you know, that they would have had anything besides Deuce as an opener or Detroit Rock City, you know. But to have this as an opener shows you how strong the song is not only to them as a band but i think to the to the fans as well i think a lot of kiss fans feel similar about this song that they have no issues with it being an opener for a concert as well as the record uh the, the only thing i thought that i found a little tiresome with this is it has nothing really to do with the song but I remember when I first put this album on and that whole circus thing at the beginning, doo, 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 at the mm. beginning, I was like, oh no, what's this? Is this going to be another one of these Ezrin things where they have oh, like, my God, it always goes back to Ezrin. Here it's we go. go. It's going to be a, oh. another <laughs> overblown piece of shit at the beginning with some guy on the radio. Oh, 13, God, cross, Get the bro, flag bro. out, Lottie. You start yeah. triggering. Yeah, here we go. And, and, and another, you know, one washing the dishes and stuff. You know, come on. Like, is it, what is it with this? these things at the top of, it, of the record? Like, a whole 30 seconds of something at least it's not as bad as destroyer like a minute of that crap at the top but you know th this way at least if they would have cut that off and just started the record what would what would have been wrong with that i mean who, how many people here actually like that clown thing at the beginning i i don't know daniel oh no my, my my brother you 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 like that thing at the top 
No, I, I think it was a, an attempt to set the mood for the record, and it was this great idea about the, the Psycho circus, circus and everything. But really, the second time you hear the song, you don't want to hear that crap. Exactly. Thank you. All right. So part two of this uh, show, which I guess we'll go through pretty quickly because we're at 90 minutes right now, is oh to re re-image the album. And there there has been the alternative sessions have leaked out. Um, so there are demos to pick and choose from. What songs would you get rid of and what would be your track order for your version of Psycho Circus? I'll go first because I'm getting rid of Within, Raise Your Glasses, You Wanted the Best, and I finally found my way. So side A of this album, I'm doing this old school, focusing on a side A and a side B. Uh, side one is going to be Psycho Circus, I Am Yours, Into the Void, We Are One, and It's My Life, packing the punch on that first side of the album. We're going to flip it over and kick off with another Paul Anthem, I Pledge Allegiance to the State of Rock and Roll, followed by I Want to Rule the World, In Your Face, Dreaming, and Journey of a Thousand Years has to remain the closer. So I'm putting Ace in his place in the middle of both sides of that album. Um, and I'm getting rid of Gene's clunkers and putting in some of his more melodic stuff because that just works better for me. Daniel, how are you re-imaging Psycho Circus? Yeah, I think they got two things right. I, I keep the first song, Psycho Circus, and, and with Journey of a Thousand Years uh three songs has to go and that's you wanted the best you got the best i finally found my way and within all of those three i have gotten rid of and i uh, i replaced them with i want to rule the world which is probably my favorite that didn't make it i really care like that chorus for some reason i don't know why the first time i heard it i immediately uh liked it and sweet and dirty love i think is an up-tempo song from gene which this album needs and of course it's my life the the maybe the best song that didn't make an album so that's how that that has to be there i think what's your track sequence well uh nothing spectacular but, but i start with psycho circus then raise your glasses sweet and dirty love i think that those three really sets the tone for the album and then an a song in your face i want to rule the world it's my life and then we turn the flip the the vinyl over and i start with dreaming but i guess i was the only one liking that song but i think that could start off side b pretty well we are one i pledge allegiance and then an A song into the void, and we continue with the you know kind of a the space thing, a journey of a thousand years. Nice, good listening, yeah. Lonnie. How about you? Um, so yeah, I got rid of some and and, and brought on some others. My track listing is um, Psycho Circus, of course, it's the best song to start off the album, followed by Sweet Dirty Love, I Pledge Allegiance, I Want to Rule the World. <laughs> Into the void and within. I got six on each side for some reason. I don't know. I much I, I couldn't keep some of these songs off. They're so darn good. Um, and then it's my life leading off side B. I think that's a perfect. Uh, that's a great side great B. way to lead off. Yep. Side B opener is it's my life. Um, I threw on body and soul just because I needed some more Paul songs on here because I think the Paul songs are just crap. I started, started so you, so you put with, the crappiest one on to prove the well, point. Well, you know, I had to leave. I had to leave off dreaming because I can't stand that. It's just so forgettable. Um, I put "We Are One" on there. I did throw "Wait, Raise Your Glasses" on here um, again because I, I needed some Paul songs in your face, and then summed it up with "Journey of a Thousand Years." Ladies and gentlemen, someone picked body and soul. I don't believe I did. Uh, damn. Gotta make two of us. <laughs> All right, Con. All America. right, Con. Throw your hat. Alani and I picked uh, <laughs> some similar songs on this one. So for me, I wanted to kind of lay it out like a Love Gun album to a degree. Um, so we start with Psycho Circus, followed by Sweet and Dirty Love. The Eyes. Then followed by uh, Into the Void for Ace. And then I bring back uh, Rain Keeps Falling, which I like mm. a lot, um, by Gene. And then Raise Your Glasses. And then ending side one as I Pledge Allegiance. Kind of like a 
tomorrow and tonight kind of end of, of that side. And then it starts off, leads off side two with It's My Life, followed by Body and Soul. And I'm going to have Peter Chris sing Body and Soul. That's going to make it a better song. No, it's not. It will. It, no, it will. It, with <laughs> Peter doing it. And then and then number three, I Want to Rule the people World. Are, people are going Kid Rock, Bud Light on that album now with Peter Chris <laughs> singing Body and Soul. Wow. Yeah. All right. Number three is, was uh, I Want to Rule the World, and then followed by Dreamin', and then ending with Journey of a Thousand Years. Wow. You two. That's just. Lonnie so and I are. Uh, Couldn't keep close. dreaming off of that, though, could you, Ken? Oh. Uh, no. Well, now, I thought now, about it, though. Now, in, in honor of Kiss Air Guitar Strings, Mark's going to provide the very first album released with no songs on it. Mark. <laughs> Yeah, there's only two songs on this album. No, just just joking. Uh, EP, so it's EP. What 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 I what I decided to do was approach this from a way different maybe than you guys. That the songs I picked on here, I'm envisioning slightly differently because I wanted to have a totally different producer do this record. I envision somebody like, and you're gonna roll your eyes, I know, but hear me out. Bob Rock, if he was the one who produced this record, it would have been much better. Number one, he's a much better songwriter than, oh, than Bruce Fairburn ever was, in my opinion. And number two, just listen to the albums that he's done over the last 20 years. Yeah, they all sound better and are better than Kiss Records. So he, now, he plays bass. Okay, but yeah, it, but I, I'm telling you, he, he, oh, my, forget it. It'll sound like a Def Leppard record. Saint so, Anger? No. Well, yeah, but besides that, listen to look at the rest of the records he's done. So yeah. for, I, I think my, my, my order of the songs are as follows. Psycho Circus will open, of course. Then I Pledge Allegiance will be, uh, so back to back, Paul. Then it'll be It's My Life, third. With the, But I like the way they did, they did it with the, with the Gene and Ace doing the vocal there I, I like how they split that i think that's a good idea to introduce ace uh fourth i had into the void and fifth i had within closing out the the album and again when i envision bob rock behind these songs doing it, it it already sounds sonically much more pleasing to me i think i think it would be much better i think he would go and restructure the songs a little bit better the weak parts and songs like within would be would be would be corrected and fixed and then we get the side two and I think Julian's gonna have a stroke because uh, side one, uh, side the first song on side two is "Sweet and Dirty Love." So Gene will start off this side, and then a revamped and fixed version of "Body and Soul" will be next. After that, Bob Rock will completely yeah. fix that. I guarantee <laughs> that? he would fix that song. Three of us. Three. Uh, yeah, it has potential, <laughs> but it is a bit cheesy, you know. <laughs> uh, and then he's I've, never been so disappointed in us. And then I have Dreaming as third <laughs> on the side, another Paul song. And then uh, something that I don't think any of you did, but I, I think it, it has to be stated that I would especially love to hear Bob's input on this. And as a true Kiss fan that I am, I kept the Peter song in there and I wanted to, to leave. I finally found my way on here and see what it would have been like if Bob came in here and revamped it, totally revamped it. Okay. Turn it into and an upbeat rocker. I yeah, I maybe you're turn it into... like, yeah, you're gonna have Peter sing um, <laughs> "Nothing Can Keep Me From You" or something like that. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> and, and, and then of course close the album with "Journey of a Thousand Years." But I'm telling you, the linchpin in this is I think Bob Rock. If he was in there and they got a different producer, in, everything would be different on this album. I think the linchpin yeah. of your album is cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And it needs a lot of it <laughs> to fix that shit. Uh, well, wow. you know what? Opinions vary, and that's a great thing yeah. about this album and the number of outtakes that we do have. You know, find the alternative Psycho Circus, um, you know, album, which does have a different guitar takes, different mixes of some of the songs. It's got all the songs that didn't make the um, album that were apparently recorded during the session. You know, but how has psycho circus age view this was a celebration of 25 years of psycho circus that we're actually even acknowledging it is a victory that this that psycho circus is still performed in the set every time the band hits the stage is a victory that you know for the most part 
the people who checked out back then are still gone and mad uh, really mm. bespeaks a success in art in that it's had a 25 year lasting impact on KISS fans. So, you know, 25 years of Psycho Circus, bring on some colored vinyl. What color do you want, Lonnie? Red and yellow swirls, you know? I think that'd be the best. Daniel, would you buy it? What color would you want? Or I, I want a picture disc. I wouldn't buy it. I wouldn't buy it, and uh, it really doesn't matter how it looks. <laughs> yeah. Mark, that's how you feel. I, I don't yeah. fucking care. I just want to go to bed. I, I, I think that Lon, Lonnie's on the right idea with the kind of red and yellow representation in there. I think that that's probably best for it. Okay. Yeah, I, I'll agree with the red and yellow kind of splatter uh, and <laughs> maybe a picture disc. Yeah, Picture disc. Like a splatter like it's left in the toilet mm. after a bad curry. All right. That's it. Psycho Circus, 25 years. What's your ranking? What do you agree with? What do you disagree with? Chime in on the comments, and we will see you in a couple of weeks. But for now, for Daniel, for Ken, for Mark, Lonnie, and myself, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for spending time listening to the Kiss FAQ podcast today. All sales are final. There are no refunds. If you'd like, look us up on Facebook or come over to the KISS FAQ message board and discuss the topic we've broadcast today. Don't forget to rate us on iTunes, Spreaker, or wherever you've listened to the show. We hope you'll join us again.